Good morning and welcome to today's Caregiver Health and Wellness Webinar, Creating Memory and Engagement at Home Intergenerational Workshop. Uh, my name is Allegra Jaffe and I am a Caregiver Specialist with the Fairfax Area Agency on Aging. Before I introduce today's speakers, I will go over a few housekeeping items with you. We will allocate a few minutes at the end of the presentation for you to submit your questions. You can do this by typing them into the question box on the bottom of your Zoom panel. Uh, we also have uh, enabled closed captioning. So if you would like to use subtitles, please utilize on your Zoom panel, um, panel to press uh, show subtitles on your closed captioning. Today's presentation is being recorded and a recording will be sent out to all the registrants within a week. And there will be a brief survey as you sign out. So please help us by giving us your feedback. And it's my pleasure now to introduce today's speakers, Nicole Knight and Dr. Kate McCarty. Nicole Knight is a dementia consultant with over 20 years of experience, primarily in the field of aging and working with individuals living with memory impairment. She is founder of Dementia Care Connections, LLC, which focuses on family support education, meaningful engagement, behavioral interventions, and empowering families so they can make the best choices. Author Kate McCarty, PhD, has over 40 years of both personal and clinical experiences with dementia. Writing training and consulting as Dr. Kate Dementia Coach, LLC. She holds a master's in thanatology and a PhD in aging studies with a focus on dementia. Nicole and Dr. Kate are gonna share their expertise with us today. Thank you, Nicole and Dr. Kate, and welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. us. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Today's presentation is gonna be Creating Memory and Engagement at Home, an intergenerational workshop with Nicole McMonagle Knight and Dr. Kate McCarty. During today's session, we're going to be uh, participating in a group exercise of reminiscing, discuss sensory engagement ideas using the five senses, identifying barriers for successful interactions, and sharing ideas to improve engagement. So let's get started with the reminiscing exercise. When, this, when you see pictures like this, what comes to mind? I think of summer camp whether it was in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, or 80s, the nostalgia feels still there. I think of campfire and sing-alongs, singing kumbaya around the campfire. I think of wacky camp aids that everyone always wanted to be just like when they grew up. I think of archery and, and swimming in the lake, maybe horseback riding. Of course, camp wouldn't be complete without sleeping in a tent. Well, for me, it was sleeping in a covered wagon, which sounds really exciting, but it's very cold at overnight. So when you think about some of these things that, um, you know, kind of come back to mind, looking, just looking at pictures, pictures are a very powerful tool. And it gets you to start thinking about uh, your past and conversation starter. Uh, thanks, Nicole. I really wish I was like had your childhood because <laughs> that whole like sleeping in a covered wagon. How cool is that? <laughs> well, and that would be how I would tailor a game that I often play in our memory cafes. And I know you have memory cafes too, but I sometimes tone it down because uh, depending on where a person is with their cognition, I wouldn't necessarily call it would you rather, but would you rather is the scenario. It is an excellent way to pull up some reminiscence. It's kind of the Montessori method because basically you're giving the person two choices. So in the camping scenario, I would say, would you rather have a bonfire or go to on a hike? Now, see, that was a lot of words. So if the person is further along and not press processing, maybe there's something, the word processing skills are challenged. Bonfire, hike, kind of simplifying that whole, whole situation. 
it can be as simple as um, marshmallow or hot dog. And I salivate, like the minute I saw your picture, I was salivating for some more, which is just sad, but, but true. <laughs> now finding those pictures, cause many of us have, like we have a box of family pictures. That's like a bunch of, this is terrible cause I am older, but it's a bunch of old people that look like really painfully unhappy. Right? So I, we don't have pictures maybe we didn't have the Polaroid or maybe we didn't process them. Maybe there's like tubes of, of, of film somewhere, but we don't have those pictures. So sometimes I can go to the library and get magazines. I can ask friends for magazines that may have some of those pictures. Um, you know, there's so many magazines out there and right now they're pretty much, they're very low price, the subscriptions. Uh, if you go to any activities closet in any facility anywhere, there will be hundreds of magazines. <laughs> so sometimes an activity for anybody from like two years old with, okay, maybe four years old with safety scissors is to make a poster about camping or to make flip cards about camping or summer kind of things. And then if you have the two cards, you can say, hold up a hot dog, hold up a marshmallow. And then we have a would you rather. I have been making up would you rathers for like a long time. And when I went to Barnes and Noble, I couldn't believe there was an entire shelf of people who'd already done this. <laughs> they already did would you rather books. There's books and books of would you rather. Um, so would you rather is a real good go-to when often I can see that the, that the group that I'm dealing with Maybe only one family member or two family members or are responding, then I can simplify it with just the two choice approach, right? Um, when we were talking about summer, would you rather catch a wave or a fish? And then it helps to repeat that sometimes. Wave, fish, so that a person's focusing on just one. Now, if you're four years old, say we're doing this in a family group, a wave is not something they can relate to. So maybe you do something like, um, I'm looking at my list here. Again, the visual helps. So crab or fish. And I think of a couple of the kids toys I have around and they have crabs and fishes in them. Now, one of the things that I like to do that I think is helpful for intergenerational is off the cuff stuff. And anybody that's ridden on a long car ride with children and no video thing in the back knows about off the cuff. So sometimes it's, um, you know, you're riding along and you're counting cows. Those are all parts of ways that we can do that no matter where we're at you can pull up a would you rather because it's here. And sometimes when you're stuck, somebody else in the group will come up with a would you rather. It's kind of like I spy with my little eye. That's a lot perhaps because sometimes our vision's not great. Um, sometimes the, the four-year-old in the family isn't going to be as quick or as tuned in. When we look at intergenerational, we have to also factor in the time that people are willing to do something. So on average in dementia world, when a person's in later stage, the cognition has changed significantly. They have like a 20 minute attention span, not dissimilar from the grandchild that's young, right? So we, got, we, wa we watch and we switch up if we can. But would you rather, it can be a 10 minute engagement. Say it's at the dinner table, which is fabulous if you can get anybody away from their phones on the dinner table. <laughs> like, okay, would you, we're planning our vacation. Would you rather go to Timbuktu or Alaska? And, and for many people, they're the same thing. <laughs> so, so you can weigh out the would you rather. So let me ask you, Nicole, would you rather see a sunrise or a sunset? A sunset. Ah, nice. You're not, not a morning person or just... I love the mornings. I actually am a morning person, but there's something magical about a sunset. And when I yeah. think of a sunset, I think of living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I still think they have the best sunsets uh, oh, that's so in, cool. on the earth that I've seen. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Now, another one that we do often is Pictionary. And we're not using the card game and the board. 
we're using paper and pen. And you see, it's an old, old, um, and I'm, I'm looking at summer foods. The category is summer foods. So, um, Nicole, what do you see here? Ooh, looks like a watermelon to me. Right, right. And then you, Nicole, might do one for me, or I will give you clues. So it can be either way, right? So um, you can work with the, the two-year-old to color a cloud and hold it up together, right? Or you can give them clues. And there are um, ch child's Pictionary games that are available. Even those were a little high end when uh, my five-year-old granddaughter pulled them out the other day. And like some of them were a little hard to draw. So we go for the simple. So what do we have here? Ooh, it looks like an ice cream cone. Yes, yes. Now, I am not, one of the things that people shy away from Pictionary is they're worried about their artistic abilities. For four years, we've been doing this in Memory Cafe and it, 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 people, people manage. And how they manage is that, so a person in later stage, it's not a very good drawler and that would be me. I'm not, I was the writer in the family, not the drawler in the family, right? It's basic and basic works. But even when the person, the other day we did roller skates and all we saw were two round things with dots in them, we could, could open Pandora's box, but, but then I give you clues, right? So, so if this had not been an ice cream cone, for example, Nicole, I might say something you get at the fair. Ooh, cotton candy. Yes, yes. So, and then if you didn't get it, I'd say it's pink and blue and it melts on your tongue. So we give clues, right? And so much of what we can do interaction wise is off the cuff with very little or no supplies, right? I mean, you could totally do descriptionary instead of pictionary, right? So um, moving along, cause of course I didn't pay attention to my time. <laughs> when we're working with intergenerational family, um, teenager with, um, 90 year old, we see a lot of differences in how people approach things. And so we're looking for the common denominator that will pull them all together. And an example would be if um, we were trying to play heads up, which is a game where you, you have a word that you put on your forehead, you don't know what the word is and everybody guesses it, right? So if I were to put up and I haven't practiced this for Nicole, so you and I would do a piece of paper or a card because we're older. Well, I shouldn't say that. You're not older. You might do the heads up that's this way. And you see, when I include a teenager and a phone, I have far more success than if I get out a board game with cards. I'm like, well, I, I'm not wasting my time with that crap, right? The same goes for things like Pictionary. We could do it on our whiteboard here very difficult. Probably only a person under 30 knows how to do the whiteboard for Pictionary, but I don't know that, but I, that's ageism on my part. <laughs> but we try to do things that will combine others. One of the beautiful things that we know is the Montessori method works for both young children and seniors with dementia. So it's perfectly okay to join together to fold the laundry. And grandma may only be able to do the tea towels and the grandson who, God willing, I don't know how you pulled this in with the technology, would be able to do the socks the way grandma deems appropriate. The socks are a tricky thing, right? Not everybody does the socks the same way. Um, sorting things, like if you had, say for instance, you have a box of, of summer decorating supplies, spending time together, sorting them out. That might be something that Nicole, your little guy, Oliver would get into in a real serious sort of way. Right? And, and you get, and part of your success is that you pull them together in a common location because we can lose a lot of energy depending on where things are being presented. So those are some uh, Montessori ideas. So we want to do intergenerational is We've seen in research how much it adds to the well-being of a person who's older. Um, there's 
a lot of segmentation in our society. Some of that is with technology. So if we can get people <clears throat> to do like the pandemic has helped us do video chats and Zooms. So finding ways to kind of to combine them together. Um, Allegra is an excellent person for TikTok. Um, and she did, I'm pretty sure she did TikToks with her grandfather. These are ways that we combine everyone into the, the happiness factor, the, the engagement. The other thing that I think is great when you pulled up your reminiscence ideas, think of how your biography influenced those pictures. Biography is so important. So if we were talking to a child who had never been at a bonfire, an adult who had never been at a bonfire, there are many probably out there, then this would not bring back any memories. It would not, it wouldn't even cross your screen. Um, when you said that you were in Arizona and it was the most beautiful sunset. If I know those clues about you, then my would you rather would be, would you rather be in Arizona or Kansas for a sunset? And see, I instantly know which way you're going to vote. And so I'm going to provide you with something that gives you that, that glow and that success factor. Um, my dad was a railroader. I, I would never do well if I did a, a world, would you rather with him on, um, would you rather work in an office or go door to door? No context, none. But if I were to say, would you rather be an engineer or a conductor? Then I'd have an answer, right? So biography drives this. And that's why it's so important. And think about it intergenerationally. Um, my granddaughter likes hearing about her grandparents. Like she likes knowing that. Um, so we get to share that way too. So even in that case, you pull out the staid McCarty clan who are all looking like they just got electrocuted in front of the <laughs> There's some value to that because we can say, well, actually she was a really cool lady and she wore gloves wherever she went and she was a rug tire. She tied rugs in the inner Baltimore and her hands were such a mess. That's why she wore the fancy gloves everywhere, but nobody knew that. Right. So you put all that together and, and you kind of have more of a, an engagement. So I'm going to let you take it away, Nicole. Sounds great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So let's considering everything that that uh, Dr. Kate just mentioned. Now let's put that into some use thinking about common things that we have at the house. Um, it's great to do engagement, but a lot of times people get caught up in the, I've got to get everything, I've got to get everything together. There's so many things I need to buy. I need to go buy puzzles and I need to buy uh, coloring pencils. And really there's so many things that you can do with the house that you don't even realize without having to buy anything. And the way I want to guide this is thinking about your five senses. So when I say the five senses, we know hearing, taste, touch, sight, and smell. And So let's talk about the sense of sight. I did a little bit of the sense of sight in that reminiscing exercise, but let's take it a step further because as Dr. Kate mentioned, maybe, maybe they never went to summer camp. So what are some things around the house that we can utilize both intergenerational or intergenerationally? So if there's magazines laying around, magazines are so great. Not only are magazines about birds and gardens, think about the National Geographic magazines and how cool they are. And a lot of the older generation have them as well. Perhaps there's a piece of art uh, in, in their house and, you know, talking about what is what it means to them. What does it look like? Taking it a step further and going, uh, you know, looking to see if there's any stamp collections or anything collecting in, in general. A lot of older adults tend to collect coins or stamps or teacups like my grandmother. Mm -hmm. She had a nice collection of teacups. So finding out what is already at the house is really is a great clue on how you can engage. And think about different ways we can utilize the teacups. Maybe we can have tea for two with, your, with the younger uh, generation and the older generation combined together. And we can just talk about nonsense or talk about what it is we like about the teacup. Where did you get the teacups? Are they family heirlooms? Or did you just find them at a garage sale? funny story about our teacups. 
I thought they were, uh, had been in the family for a long time. No, they're all flea market teacups that, <laughs> that my grandmother really enjoyed and my mother liked them. And so now I have them. Nice. So they sit proudly in my cabinet and technically they are a family heirloom. They got passed down. Mm -hmm. They're just not our family heirloom to start with, <laughs> but now, now it's ours and we'll pass them down. So there's lots of different ways here using a sense of sight, uh, just looking around and being that detective around the house. You know, maybe it's engaging with together watching the Golden Girls. Now I'll tell you, I never realized when I watched the Golden Girls as a, as a younger adult, how racy and fun it was. I mean, they're really edgy. <laughs> Older adults edgy, how fun is that? So I really think even for something like the Golden Girls, the younger generation would really appreciate it. It's, it's hilarious. Uh, as well as looking at, as we talked about old photos, maybe you didn't go to camp, but maybe there's a yearbook or you went to, they went to the military academy. Ask them questions about the pictures. You know, who's in this picture? What position did you play? Um, you know, who, what types of teams did you play? So there's so many things we can do uncovering, looking at sight. Oh, the fun one, the sense of hearing whether it's listening to music or sounds of the ocean or birds and nature outside. What if it's the sound of uh, your favorite music playing? Now music's really changed over the years, but one thing I've known for, for a fact is that um, people tend to have their favorite, their favorite songs that they've had from growing up. They just kind of stick with you. So for the younger generation, that might be a little bit different. The songs are a little bit different, aren't they? But what a better way to introduce each other to your, your preference of music by going on YouTube on the phone, you know, using the younger generation's phone and going on YouTube and finding, you know, who, who are the Beatles? Maybe you don't know. Uh, and so I'll, be, I'll let you know there actually is someone I know that didn't know who the Beatles were, uh, younger adult. So <laughs> what a great way to introduce them to. And, and also in the sense that maybe you don't know who an, uh, you know, some of the newer artists is. Now, I would certainly venture to say trying to find a clean version of any song you're, you're going to be playing. But try to listen to each other's music and see, you know, what the appeal is and talk about it. What is it about that song that, that, that's exciting? What does it make you think of? As we know with the brain, when the brain's changing, oftentimes uh, music is one of the last things to go. So utilizing music, whether it's um, music that is spiritual, um, hymns, or just plain out fun. The sense of smell. This one's a little trickier. People don't often use this one. But if you take a look at this picture, can you smell it? It's almost like you want to scratch and sniff it. The smell of lemons, the smell of citrus, the smell of onions. Ooh. I don't, maybe I won't do that one, but you, you think about uh, the different things, different household items that you might have in your pantry or outside, and, and that sense of smell is evoked. Smell can be very powerful. This one, I think, is probably the most underutilized. I think but people get shy away from it because they say they, you lose it sometimes, yeah. but I think it's really important to know that just because you don't smell lavender your brain still receives the calming effect. So it's interesting you say that. At one of my memory cafes, I actually brought in about 10 different mason jars and I covered them up and I didn't tell anybody what was inside. <clears throat> and we went around the room and I, I would bring a different smell and I had them guess the smells. They got them almost all right. I think there was one, there was one we couldn't quite put our finger on it. Cool. <clears throat> so it was really interesting. And now of course I'm using some of the more common smells, citrus, uh, lavender, mint. Uh, the cinnamon, it, it was really fascinating to, to see. And I wasn't sure how it would go. I thought, well, we're either gonna, we're either gonna all fail, but we're all fail together and it'll be fun and we'll get a good laugh out of it. But no, right. not at all. So, you know, the sense of smell, you can also combine it with, if you look at the pine cone, um, the, the tactile part of it too, feeling it, what it, what it feels like. Yes. The sense of taste, which is probably my favorite besides the hearing one. Using food. So there's so many times we're cooking together and, and cooking oftentimes is a very social, a social activity. So if we're preparing a lunch together, and when I say preparing lunch together, what we want to do is focus on the smaller steps. 
uh, starting with complicated recipe, maybe making uh, you know grandma's favorite bread, that might be a little bit tough to start with. It's just a lot of steps involved. So let's just think simpler. You know, whether it's just cutting up fruit and having a bite. And you can even take it a step further and close your eyes and see if you can guess what, what you just tasted and describe what it feels like in your mouth. Maybe you're having something crunchy. And so you're, you're doing things together. And the sense of taste, you can organize a different way. Like Kate mentioned, you could, maybe we're sorting first. So we're going to sort and put the pretzels in one and the chips in the other um, and, the, and the pretzel sticks and the goldfish. So that's one activity right there. And now we're going to try them all. Maybe we're going to rank them and, and so which ones are the best? Which ones do you like the best? Um, so there's lots of ways to, to bring in the taste. And of course, a lot of times with taste, if we look at the cookies, who doesn't, who doesn't know what the smell of a chocolate chip cookie smells like? Um, it's a great, it's a great smell. So if you're, if you're hungry and you've got cookies around, you know, that smell is uh, making you even more hungry. So let's utilize these sense of taste. Maybe we're having a taste test contest with the cookies. And the other one here is the sense of touch. There are so many things around the house that we can utilize with the sense of touch. Uh, Dr. Kate mentioned a few of them, folding laundry and doing it together. Or maybe if they're further along progress in the disease process, we're going around the house just finding unusual fabrics to feel. You'd be surprised what you'd find in someone's house. I was in a client's house once and I was just trying to find a few unusual objects so we can talk about things found a wool scarf, a, a silk handkerchief. Just if you look around, you'd be surprised what you find. And that sense of touch, it's just, it, it invokes a lot of uh, um, feelings as well. And you can talk about it. Well, this is rough. Okay, well, what do you think this is soft or smooth? Or um, is it agitating your skin? So talking about it, what's the color like too? Mm -hmm. The sense of touch with flowers that tactile, you know, some people are better than others of arranging flowers. I'm not one of those people. I'm good, I can put them in, they, they'll look okay. But I just can't quite get the stems right. Well, that's okay. It's the act of, of touching it and that feeling that you have, especially if you enjoyed flowers or garden uh, growing up. Sometimes you just have a mismatch of, of, uh, of materials and different objects in a box together. I know during the holiday time, I'll just grab different ornaments, different little sprigs of things, and we'll talk about them. You know, what is this, what does this remind you of? And you're touching it, you're smelling it, you're using all of your senses all at once. And of course, planting. Not everybody likes to plant uh, gardens, but, um, and some people tend to overcomplicate it. They'll say, oh gosh, it's so hot outside, we're doing all these things. Well, bring it inside. Bring a little colander with some dirt, and maybe you're just gonna plant some herbs. So the, the point of the matter is over, uh, don't over uh, complicate it. So looking at household items and using your senses to, as a guide. I want to take a moment first because Kate has to, uh, has a, has to mention the, the sixth sense as well. Yes, um, I've found through the years and, and it might be very generational, but the sixth sense is the spiritual sense. Um, you notice behind me, this is a, a reminiscence picture from my past. It's El Yunque, which is a rainforest in Puerto Rico. So um, that that it's an immersion. So we can, as intergenerationally, we can pull up nature. Often, again, biography feeds into this. So when we talk about the sixth sense, we want to never place somebody um, in an awkward position where they're we're reminiscing about things they know nothing about or that they're offended by. So that is one thing. Um, years ago, I worked with a client who was Hindu and I knew just this much. I know a little bit more now, but we were able to celebrate Diwali because there are commonalities that we all share in the sixth sense. It, if in the very broadest sense, it's the idea that there's something bigger than you. Many people, um, if you look at how we move back in time in our comfort zone and we start thinking more like home-like mm -hmm. and like children, many people had wrote memory of songs and hymns. Those are very important and they can change a mood to, you know, uh, even, even folks that are professed one way today, they will still remember 
the strategies and the music of the past. So, you know, and I, I feel very blessed. I never used to feel blessed, but I've been so eclectic that I can like get down with an old Baptist tune or a Hindu chant. I'm good. <laughs> it either way works for me, but it, it's a holistic. We are all whole people. Um, how we do that intergenerationally, you know, it might be as simple as singing it if you're happy and you know it, right? Because, <laughs> you know, it could be positive psychology. It could be Jesus loves me. It could be making that treat for a taste sensation that relates to that time, Hamatashin, for example, for Purim. So we have ways, but we want to never neglect that sixth sense. Sometimes it's poetry, you know? I try to make sure my kids know my favorite poets just in case. <laughs> right? so, so that sixth sense is just another way to involve, particularly when a person appears to not have that sense of well-being. And it's so much music is so powerful for that. And we have so many apps now, um, Insight Timer, Headspace, Calm, where you can just listen to waves. Now, if you never had been to the ocean, that means nothing. But if you've been to the forest, then the sounds of the forest make a difference, right? So all of that is a way to sort of take those five and heighten them up to include that six. So that, that, that works well. Uh, when we look at the hierarchy of needs, and I think, did, Nicole, do you have that slide or not? I don't remember if you did. I don't have that slide. That's okay. We have, um, it's Abraham Maslow, a psychological theorist from back in the day. Basic needs are at the bottom. They're the foundation. Why this is important to this discussion is that whether it's the four-year-old or the 90-year-old, you will not be successful if they are hungry, <laughs> if they need to go to the restroom, if they're uncomfortable cold, if they're in pain. So we want to always be aware that the basic needs have to come first. Um, note to those who are family caregivers. Um, my first individual with Alzheimer's was my father-in-law about 30 years ago. And he, uh, the one the personal, a personal individual the caregiving situation, we lived with him. So I had nine and an 11 and a 12 year old, two, four adults. And to be quite honest, it was all we could do to keep him dry, fed, and off the street. And I know that sounds really lame. So I want to say that these are great ideas. Use them as tools, not as weapons, because we understand that it's not easy to do all this. But if there's just some piece of this that helps you as you're dealing with incontinence, right? If you can, I mean, I, Nicole, you and I have had a lot of institutional experience if singing um, I'll Fly Away, Oh Glory helps somebody get to the restroom, then by all means, we're doing that. Um, I had a fellow that would only shower with me, even though I was the activities person, and he only showered when I played um, football fight songs. He was a football player. So. I can understand that. <laughs> right? so, so that's what we're saying about meaningful engagement. We are not saying that you need to be um, the official activities director like we have in facilities because that is a lot. However, think about this. If we can empower that teenager to just pull up on YouTube Frank Sinatra for Gramps, we've made progress, right? So that's kind of that. But you have to do the basic needs first. Um, we know that um, in dementia world, behaviors are based in unmet needs. So when someone is wandering, they may well be looking for a restroom or they may be wet. Um, when someone's cranky, and I say this because I just watched my 10-year-old grandson and he didn't have his full breakfast and he was in a car seat and he was very cranky and granny got off the phone quick because <laughs> that's not granny's problem. <laughs> but, but basic needs have to be met before you can have the fun stuff. That's sort of the way it goes. So I think that's good. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Nicole. Sounds great. Thank you. Some ideas for those that live in the local uh, Washington, D.C. metro area. Um, going to great outdoors. I mean, what a great way to get all of these senses evoked uh, using your great outdoors. So there's different parks and nature centers. 
for those that live in Fairfax County. I mean, my goodness, the options are endless. There's so many free things to do or low cost activities at some of the centers, whether it's Glen Echo. Uh, fun fact about Glen Echo, Glen Echo used to be an amusement park uh, back in the day. So it's really cool, it's fun, but a lot of people remember going there as a kid. Uh, and so it's really fun to go there and just find out, tell me what it was like as a kid to go here. I mean, it was, it was quite, quite extravagant. Um, Great Falls Park, the little gardens. There's lots of little gardens. Uh, my favorite garden in the area is Green Spring Gardens. They, uh, to even make it even another step up is they often have uh, an, art, an art exhibit inside. So there's always a rotating art exhibit from local artists in there. And it's just fun to, to look around at. And then, of course, Memory Cafe. Uh, both Dr. Kate and I do facilitate memory cafes. You might hear the term quite a bit. They're just monthly social gatherings. So people with early stage, um, maybe just concerned about memory. Maybe they just need some socialization. It's okay. And we tend to include the care partner. So that care partner could be the adult child, could be the young child. Uh, it could be an actual caregiver. A care partner is really just a, a term uh, you know, the, the partner that's participating in care. Um, there's no cost to attend these, and there's so many of these. Uh, there, there's actually a, a month or a memory cafe network nationwide. So if there's not one that's during a time that's convenient for you, guess what? There's probably someone somewhere in the country that's doing one that, that might be a good fit for you time-wise. And they're usually structured activities, but not always. Some of them are different. Some focus on music. Uh, but they all promote socialization. And so what a better way to watch your loved one interact with, with others than sitting there together. And the best thing is you don't have to plan anything. It's already planned out. Uh, and you get to participate in different word games or trivia or reminiscing or whatever that, that day may bring. It's always changing. So let's talk about now. So there's some barriers to overcome with this. And, and Dr. Kate mentioned some of the most, of course, is uh, meeting, making sure that the basic needs are met first. Uh, I think about that even with my toddler. Uh, you know, I have to meet his basic needs before we go have fun anywhere. So some tips for success. Let's fit these activities into your current schedule. I'm not asking you to make a big routine and a big plan and here's our plan for the week. Well, that's great, but that doesn't usually work and it's usually quite cumbersome to plan. So let's find out what your current activity schedule is. When I say activity schedule, what time do they get up? Um, what time do they have breakfast? Okay, then you've got some time usually, a lag time before lunch. So maybe we fit in something fun there. Maybe something after lunch or maybe grandma or grandpa or your parent takes a nap after lunch. So don't change everything, but let's just plug in a few things here and there. Let's keep it simple. I talked about a lot of different ideas and, it, and it, people tend to get caught up in overcomplicating things. Keep it simple. Use what a client or a person has in their house. As I mentioned, we don't need to go out to the store and buy all these crafts, it's too much. And it can just be very, it can just get really messy and the purpose of the activity just gets goes out the door. So let's modify it as needed. Uh, Dr. Kate mentioned this is with the Pictionary. So at first she held up a picture, I guessed it. What if I didn't guess it? We wouldn't want me to fail in the activity. So she would set me up for success and start describing it. Well, what if I still didn't get it? Then maybe I would give clues like it starts with a C. It's cotton, maybe giving a verbal clue because they just quite can't get it. And then see if maybe the, the word retrieval is, is helping. So there's different ways we can modify the activity, but allow them time to see if they can get it as well. And if they say the wrong answer and they say it loud and proud, you know what? That's a, that's a great answer. Yeah, that's right. The sky is purple today and I love it. Don't worry about the end result. We often focus on the end result. That is human nature. Start to finish. Who cares? A to Z. No, we got to get it done. No, maybe today we just got A to D. And isn't that great? That was fun. We had a good time doing it. Allow time to rest with anybody. We can't keep you know, putting too many things on their schedule. And also for yourself. If you're the one and your family members are rotating, trying to keep the whole family uh, engaged, allow time for them to rest and you to rest but maintain somewhat of a routine. My favorite here is minimize or minimize overstimulation. 
oftentimes I go to someone's house and the TV's on, which is fine. TV's fine. It has its purpose. But we're trying to engage in conversation, all sitting together, talking, you know, with the family and the TV's on, the radio's going. There's too many things going on. They can't follow the conversation. So turn off the TV, maybe keep the crowd to a minimum. Family gatherings are great during the holiday time, but they can be very overstimulating as well. So if you're noticing that your loved one is a you know, family gathering, or maybe in the summertime, they have a lot of family reunions, people are getting back together again. If you're noticing they're a little overstimulated, just kind of take them off for a little bit, maybe go for a little walk, bring them back to the situation. And make sure you're gonna set everything up in advance. So when I say set up in advance, if you're gonna be doing some type of um, cooking activity, set the ingredients out ahead of time because you've already lost them if you're going through and trying to find everything. Oh, is this one, is this one sugar or is this one salt? Let me see. You've already lost them in that. So if you set up a little bit, if you can in advance, then it just helps to make the, uh, the engagement and the activity uh, more successful. I'm going to use my, um, my, I'm going to date myself and say, I always think of the gambler, know when to fold up. Like when things are going terribly wrong, be ready to just say, okay, and give up, right? And I don't mean give up in a bad way, but because we want success, know when to fold up. So we thank you so much and uh, Allegra, if there's any questions, we'd love to answer them. Yes, so at this point, um, I'm going to invite our audience to submit your questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom panel, uh, and then I'll read them to the presenters. Uh, uh, we do have a question though, as far as reminiscing, is there such a thing as um, too much reminiscing? in somebody's day? Is, that, is there a negative so, overdoing it? You, so reminiscing, when I talk about that, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, sometimes, let's say you hit a nerve. Um, I'm reminiscing about something and I think it's going great and then all of a sudden I say something that, that triggers them. Maybe it's a, a past memory that they've suppressed their whole life. And okay. now all of a sudden I flooded them with emotions. You need to be able to read the person. And when I say read it, uh, see how their emotions are. If, if all of a sudden they step up or start getting emotional, being emotional about something um, can be positive. If you're thinking about maybe a memory of someone, but if it starts agitating them, that's when I would start to maybe try to redirect out of it, validate how they're feeling. Um, yes, I imagine that would feel like that, but if they take a dark turn, you've got to help redirect out of that. And then maybe we don't try that again for a little while, uh, or maybe we just avoid it altogether, that topic. Right. Uh, so too much reminiscing. I think there's something to be said, uh, at least in uh, Kate, I'm, I would love to hear what you think about it, but I think, uh, I don't think you can have too much reminiscing. I, no. I just think it's such a, it's, you're in the moment. We're talking about those moments now. And if that gets you in that moment, uh, where it evokes joy, why not? Right. And if there was a situation where you saw a trigger, it might be time to talk to a social worker because there are ways, despite cognitive change, that you can allow, help that person. We're not qualified to do that. We just need to know where the soft points are. I had an excellent example of this last weekend in the swim spa. My little granddaughter is like, Granny, I forget what we were talking about. And um, I oh, I know, we were wishing on a star. And she said, uh, she said, I bet you wish Gramps was less annoying. <laughs> This is hysterical, but but then I said, no, actually, I wish that I have a long life so I can see my grandchildren grow big and strong and be adults. And she said, let's not talk about that because she has death anxiety. She has death anxiety and is in counseling for it. I wouldn't have thought that that would have brought that, but that was not mine to touch anymore. I just said, well, I'm so grateful that we get to wish on the stars today. And we, we redirect it, right? I mean, and just like- That's a great point. It goes both ways for the, for the younger generation and the older generation. It does, it does. It's, it's very much, but reminiscence therapy comes through loud and strong in all of the research as a powerful tool. Perfect. Um, another question from the audience. How can I find out about specific cafes? So there is a, a network, a, a nationwide network. It's Memory uh, Cafe Network. 
I don't know the exact web address, but if you type I in got it, it. Memory Cafe, Cafe, Cafe Directory. Yes, yeah, Directory. And it's Thank international. You. It is. And yes. so they have it by state listed. Uh, my recommendation is to, you're, they usually have, you know, by state and then where they are, how often they're being held. Uh, if they're virtual or in person, they have a directory for in person and virtual. And then I would recommend contacting them ahead of time to make sure that the group is still going on. Some yes, of the virtual groups have now gone back in person and some uh, have just changed. I mean, it just, uh, they've changed groups or changed dates and times. And we both have ours on our sites, what, whatever we're doing. Um, yeah. Can you repeat that again, Kate? The, the Yes. It's Memory Cafe Directory. I think it's a dot com. Okay. Memory Cafe Directory. Yes. So something really cool about that. So the Memory Cafe facilitators, they uh, once a quarter, we all get together. We all get together once a quarter uh, and, and talk about best practices, ideas, how to start cafes, um, lots of really cool things. So this is these are these are all people, volunteers, all nationwide uh, and international that are all putting together, you know, best practices and just fun ideas and how to, you know, even starting um, bilingual cafes. I mean, there's there's so many different different things that we're talking about behind the scenes that people just don't even realize. That's great. We have a, a comment um, in the from the audience. My dad um, laments how much he misses my mom. She's been uh, dead for 21 years all day, every day. I'm out of constant um, sympathy. Do you have any um, comments back to that? Or um, one of the things that um, I, I'm sorry, I got distracted. It's memorycafedirectory.com. I did check it down. I had to push many verification buttons. Um, one of the things that I suggest for folks who get stuck, kind of stuck in that complicated grief is, and, and I, I know this is very hard, so I'm not saying this cavalierly, but can you ask him, what do you miss most? So a uh, validation technique, Naomi File brought it out. There's all kinds of training on it. Uh, validation Breakthrough is the book, but basically trying to validate his sadness. Because what we want to do is like, good grief, dad, she's been gone forever. Will you stop already? You're driving me nuts. <laughs> and I get that. I totally understand that. But clearly there's something he hasn't completed that he needs to express. Also, it could be based in an unmet need. Maybe he's bored. And so this anxiety loop, maybe he does need a little antidepressant, maybe a serotonin reuptake inhibitor something to take a little bit of that anxiety edge off, reasonable, not, we're not talking zombifying people, we're talking just taking a little bit of the edge off. But I often wonder if, if it could be boredom and I could see where maybe the remnant, I mean, this is a bold try, but bringing out the pictures and like really doing a deep dive into mom might help alleviate and it might not. And that would be something to try. Nicole, what are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I think, you know, there's really not black and white when it comes to memory impairment or any type of cognitive impairment. It's a lot of trial and error. And if, if you try and you fail, well, that's what we just won't be done again. Um, we've all, I mean, I've, I've failed. I remember the first time I failed. Um, and, and I said, okay, I, lesson learned. I, I will, you know, now I know for this person that didn't work. And so um, you just don't know until you try it. And it might be different. Maybe you try it again the same way a week later and it didn't work quite so well. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like an element of depression is involved. Um, you know, I, from caregivers sometimes, um, the if somebody had somebody who passed away, but they don't remember, <laughs> And so it's something they're asking, you know, where is this person? Is there a, a certain way that you two would suggest how to handle that um, conversation that comes up about somebody who's passed and, and they don't remember? Yeah, I, so I think, um, and I'd love to hear, um, Dr. Key, because I know we both have experience with this. So I think there's a, a point. So if someone doesn't remember that they, they ask where their husband is and they, uh, and they don't realize they passed away. Um, so there's different ways of going about that. And if they're asking, they're resistant, and they're becoming very agitated, you know, validating to them, uh, you, you want to make sure that if someone does pass, let me start this over. So if they do pass and their loved one did not know that they passed, you, you do want to tell them and validate that, that 
they give them that closure, allow them that time for closure. Um, because a lot of times people often forget about them. Um, they're a spouse that has dementia. Now they didn't realize their spouse passed. Oh, we won't tell mom, it'll just agitate her. Well, can you imagine finding out um, for the first time that your loved one did pass? And for them, it's the first time every time. So I think validating and letting them know and being honest with them and how they're feeling and then gauging their response by it. So the next time, if they're belligerent and upset and why did no one tell me and I can't believe this and blah, blah, blah okay, then we need to change our answer a little bit, but at least you validated and told them and were honest with them in the beginning. But for their, for their own sake um, and their um, you know, agitation levels, we may change our answer a little bit. And, and, but it's, it's, a really, it's really interesting. I mean, I've had people that have asked you know, all throughout the day about their loved one um, being dead. Are they dead? And flat out asking, are they dead? Are they dead? Uh, so if you know that it'll upset them again, hearing it all the time, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I can find out. I, I don't think anything's wrong, but let me go find out. Um, yeah. Katie, I'm sure you've got. Yeah. You know, that's yeah, a very, that's that's a very com simple answer for very complex. Device. It is. It's very complex because it's biography driven uh, and, you know, what the person's personality is, et cetera. But often after the first initial, like trying to give completion, then that's more then the next step would be again that back to that what do you miss the most or i'm not sure where she is right now but i sure do think she's a great person don't you to sort of elicit the good stuff and if they're really focused they will say okay yes yeah, she's a good person but where is she right now well she's she's not here right now but I feel, and this is where therapeutic fib fibbing comes back. Absolutely. I, I Coming back in a little bit, like then she'll be here at six o'clock. Yeah, because she's she's always been there for you. So I feel like she's she's going to be here any minute. And I know that is a lie. And I've had pastors call me on fibbing. I'm trying to enter their reality. And their reality cannot take that information that she's gone. So instead, I'm going to offer solace for the moment, in the moment, that yeah, I really miss her too. She's pretty fabulous. And sometimes when you use the past tense, they catch you. What do you mean was fabulous? She is fabulous. Yes, she is fabulous. This is where the sixth sense comes in and you hope that, you know, <laughs> oh, something bigger is going to help, right? But it's not an easy situation it's an and easy it's fairly thing. common. There, there are times where people can go as far as saying, well, she just called and she said she's going to be late, but she'll be here after dinner. So why don't we go ahead and, and do this? Because they'll sit there and wait. Yes. But here's where you've got to know what's going on in their brain change. If, they're not, if they don't have um, you know, short-term memory loss like that, and they can hang on to that thing, you're not going to want to say, oh, she's coming at five and it's 445. And she remembers that, or they remember at five o'clock, 15 minutes later, now you lied to them. And now I know you lied to me. Right. So you really need to understand what's going on with their brain. Um, so I like saying after dinner, after that. So that's a little bit more time away uh, to where they may not catch you. Because I've been caught before. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's horrifying because you didn't realize you were going to get caught. You didn't like, realize oh, they're going to hold you to that 15 minutes. Yes, Absolutely. yes. In a little while. The vagaries are good. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, another question. Um, caregivers can be very busy, especially if they're caring for a younger and older generation. So, so that's the sandwich generation caregiver. How much time um, should they put into their schedule to do these type of activities? You, you kind of mentioned this before. But... Yeah, a little bit. I mean, any little bit of time can be there. You know, that's why I say keep it simple. I mean, you don't, we're not talking, we don't have to do a whole hour of activity. That's a lot. That's a lot in your day. So if there's little things that you can set up here throughout the day and uh, with proper setup, they can, they can engage um, much easier. You know, you could have the, the, the laundry set there on the side. And so they get around to it when they're just sitting there and they're bored watching TV. I mean, I don't want to overcomplicate things. So little bits here and there. But just don't don't stress on that part of it because it, you can get caught up in making a huge you know a huge calendar out of it. You don't need to do that. You want it to be functional. So like if the teenager is required to set the table, then maybe the older generation folds the napkins. Yeah. That's a meaningful engagement. We did it together. It doesn't have to be all fun and balloons. Okay, terrific. And, and back to the your basic needs that you both mentioned that the basic needs to be need to be met. When you have all these different generations of different people, you know, 
taking different naps maybe at a different time or going to school etc and somebody said it can be really hard to find that time that works for everyone do you have any suggestions on how to figure that out I think really just looking at the schedules one if you know mom or dad takes a, a nap on um, you know in the afternoon okay but the kids don't get home from school till three o'clock you know, the summertime is a great time to kind of experiment with all these things because the schedule is a little more flexible for the kids at least. But, you know, finding out, just kind of getting a general idea. And you don't really know until you try. Maybe maybe 3 or 4 p.m. is when everyone's available and awake. But guess what? Mom's sundowning. So um, that you have to give grace for that. And so, but maybe that's a great time to get her involved in an activity because it keeps her mind off of wanting to go home, even though this is where she's living now. So. Um, I think, you know, it's kind of a little experimenting, trying here and there. Um, people tend to be best in their, they be their best selves in the morning too, what we find with older adults. Um, so typically mid mornings, uh, usually tend to be pretty good too. And I would be very cautious. Don't, don't, um, expect a lot. Like if you did one thing a week that you could chart, that was like fabulous, that would be amazing. And it might be just the golden girls. I don't, I'm, we're not, we're not aiming high here. We just want to have the generations share time pleasantly. That's kind of the bottom line. Think about how rewarding that is for the younger generation. They have those memories to take with them after their loved one has, has passed about those moments. You know, we used to play bridge together or we used to play, you know, or we, we used to go out in the back and, you know, throw some horseshoes together. I guess the other, I guess the bigger take home then for me, because of the grandpa and the nine and 11 and 12 year old, is that they are now in their forties. And I can tell you every one of their careers has been enhanced because they know how to work with an older person. And we didn't have a lot of fun. I mean, we had, we had the nine-year-old rescuing, rescuing grandpa from adult day because he wouldn't come out because his, his wife was crazy. So, you know, they weren't all fabulous, engaging memories, but they are much better people because we did it and uh, we didn't do it very well. So be gentle on yourselves. Thank you so much. And we're actually we're here at the end of our time. So I want to thank you both so much for all these examples. And, and just like you said, it could be, you know, watching a TV show or that everyone agrees on, or, you know, I love the idea of just finding different textures in the house. I haven't heard of that one before. So or it's using sight. So terrific ideas. Thank you both so much. And as we're getting ready to wrap up, there is gonna be that brief survey. So please take a moment uh, to answer those questions to let us know what you're interested in for our upcoming series. Uh, Nicole and Dr. Kate, thank you again, again so much for your knowledge that you, you shared with us today. Um, and to everyone in our audience, thank you for being here. Our next caregiver webinar will be on Wednesday, August the 17th from 12 to 1 p.m on supporting a loved one living with mental illness. Uh, we hope you can join us then. And I wish everyone a great afternoon and a great weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Allegra. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank you.